Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to the Hans Arnold Center and to the first of our fellows lectures of the current winter and spring semester. Uh, it's wonderful to have Raven Chacon speak uh, tonight about his academy project. I'm already completely gespannt, as you say, about the image, which somehow looks familiar to me, so I want to see if I'm, I'm right. Uh, and we're also very thankful to Inge Maron Otto, whose support of our composition fellowship allows us to bring innovative artists to Berlin and gives them the opportunity to realize ideas in a spotlight concert at the end of their time here. It's also an honor that uh, Volker Strebel, the director of the master program Sound Studies and Sonic Arts, at the Berlin Career College of the UDK has agreed to introduce Raven this evening. Uh, Volker is a dear friend of the Academy. Uh, we're very happy to continue our partnership with him and the Sound Studies program, especially after last year's performance series, Talix, by fellow Tessia Machado, uh, and the previous year's presentation of David Berman's work at the Sophienkirche. Neither performance would have been possible without your help, Volker, and the support of the audio communication group at the Technical University Berlin. In his research, uh, Volker Strebel focuses on electroacoustic music, the American and European avant-garde, intermedia, performance, and sound art. He has published widely on sound art, media-specific music, John Cage, Alvin Lucier, and Phil Niblock. From 2009 to 14, he, he directed the electronic music studio at the Technische Universität Berlin, and a musician himself, uh, Volker Strebel has realized and performed indeterminate works by John Cage and his own compositions. A warm welcome to you first for your introduction, then we'll hear from uh, Raven. We'll have some time for questions and discussions afterwards, and then a modest reception next door. So a very good evening, and welcome again, and Volker. Yeah, thank you for this very nice and warm introduction. Um, Michael Steinberg, uh, Raven Chacon, dear fellows and distinguished visitors of the American Academy of Berlin, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be back at the American Academy and it's a pleasure to introduce the Academy's new Inga Maren Otto Fellow in Music Composition mm -hmm. to you, Mr. Raven Chacon. He is originally from the Navajo Nation was born in 1977 in Arizona and now lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. When he's not traveling, what he just told me, what he extensively does. Raven Chacon was exposed to music early on by his grandfather singing Navajo songs and later he took piano lessons and studied music notation. In the tradition of American experimental music, Chacon became also interested in creating sounds in non-traditional ways like audio tape manipulation and experimental percussion. Raven Chacon studied music at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque in the late 1990s. Since the 1970s, Albuquerque and the nearby Santa Fe have been known for their active communities interested in a quite unique approach to contemporary and experimental music influenced by the experience of the Southwest. Here, composer and musicologist Peter Garland published his seminal magazine Soundings that presented scores and writings by composers like Edgar Varese, Lou Harrison, and Kenlon Nancaro, names we consider cornerstones of American history today, but whose music was not easily accessible, accessible back then. Peter Garland also researched and published music of Native American and Pueblo cultures, and his own compositions of the 1970s and 80s clearly show this influence. And finally, we find then contemporary music by James Tenney, Pauline Oliveros, Robert Ashley, and Daniel Lenz published in Soundings, also evidence of this thriving experimental music community in New Mexico. It was this milieu the 20-year-old Chacon came upon on, at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. He later continued his, educa his education at the California Institute of the Arts, where he studied with the late James Tenney and Michael Pizarro. 
I had the pleasure to have a closer look at Chacon's more recent string quartet, Double Weaving of 2014, that shows a skilled and somewhat playful approach to classic elements of American modernism and experimentalism. Quarter tone clusters that lead to psychoacoustic beating patterns, glissandi of the whole ensemble that obscure tonal orientation, a range of notation techniques that allow for different degrees of freedom in the moment of performance. Most beautiful are bars that consist of nothing else but rests. Here, each musician is requested to perform a silent emphasis on another of the four silent beats, first the cello, then the first violin, the second violin, and finally the viola. It's a great example that music can't be reduced to mere sound. And also in double weaving, the third movement consists of a graphic notation where, like in certain wall drawings by Solowit, lines are to be performed in parallels, but the distances between the lines are involuntarily shifting, creating changing intervals. What I find most striking in this notation is that there are two instances where the musicians need to make the time run backwards to properly perform the lines. And I brought with me a reproduction of this movement. So you see the score, the musicians are supposed to follow the lines. This axis uh, represents pitch, and this is the timeline. And when you are a musician and you follow this line here, here, you need to play backwards in time. <laughs> yeah. Raven is a composer of chamber music, a performer of experimental electronic and noise music. A video shows him scratching with antlers on amplified sheets of metal, and an installation artist. It might have been the interdisciplinary approach to art education at Kell Arts that liberated him from the limitations of genres and the expectations that come with them. Chacon is a composer who also painted bands and other shapes with natural pigments and ash on an iceberg. To watch the snow and ice change form with different light, then fall and allow the colors to disperse. When I stood here last year, Introducing the Academy's music fellow, Tassia Machado, a week after Donald Trump's inauguration, I, who had uh, grown up in Berlin during the separation, felt the need to comment on the president's plan to build a wall at the Mexican border. Today, we welcome a composer and artist to Berlin who, in 2015, had participated in the land art project Repellent Fence that established a line of tethered balloons two miles long at the US-Mexico border in the Arizona desert to critique the oversimplified border rhetorics. Well done, American Academy, well done. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to Raven Kaufmann's stay here in Berlin to experience his art and aesthetic reflections. And I'm now looking forward to his presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Volker. Yate, Raven Chikoni Nishye, Toto Chitni Nishle, Nakai Dene Bashish Chin, Dokia Ani Dashinale, Nakai Dene Dashiche, Nakai Dene Dashinale, Biel De Dasinil, De Nasha, Chin Li, Arizona, De Nasha. Thank you for. Uh, everybody for coming to my talk tonight. And uh, thank you for the American Academy for having me here. Um, I think I'm happy that I'm going first, but uh, I, I truly look forward to the presentations of my colleagues that will happen over the semester, and I hope uh, all of you can attend those as well. Um, there's a lot of works that I uh, have done recently, and Folker has talked about some of those. And uh, tonight I just decided to talk about some of the research that I'll be doing here at the Academy and, uh, and place some works within that because 
Um, I find that they have relevance even in my current research, some of these past projects. <coughs> in December of 2016, one week after Donald Trump was elected as the 45th President of the United States, I was invited by my friend uh, Chinupa Hanska Luger, a uh, Hunkpapa Lakota artist who's based in Santa Fe. Uh, I was invited by him to join him on one of his runs back to his home community, which is a Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota. Uh, the approved energy transfer partners Dakota Apps Access Pipeline uh, through his traditional homelands uh, had prompted a worldwide response and protest and gathering at the site of the construction. It was important to go to the Standing Rock gathering for a few reasons. Firstly, there were many people from my own community, as well as friends and relatives from other Native nations heading to the camp. As of September 2016, the protest had become the single largest gathering of Native Americans in more than 100 years since the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. It was important for me to learn about the encroaching of this pipeline and to offer my friend help on his journey back to his reservation. Another reason that I decided to go, my collective, Post Commodity, uh, had been working on a new artwork utilizing long-range acoustic devices, LRADs for short. LRADs are hyperdirectional sonic weapons, first used by commercial cargo ships off the coast of Africa then later by military forces around the world, and more frequently and recently uh, used by police departments in the United States for non-lethal but extremely painful crowd control. Capable of producing loud sounds and the ability of beaming these sounds for, for miles, they had begun to be used on Americans at the G20 summit in 2009, and again at Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Oakland gatherings. There are reports that similar speakers have been used on de detainees at Guantanamo. So I had heard from my friends and, and heard from others on social media saying that there was an increasing presence of these uh, military grade uh, weapons being brought to the boundaries of the Ocheti Shakoen uh, water protector camp. So I decided if I was going to uh, be using these weapons in, in an artwork, I should, I should research them. Uh, these, these speakers which use sound to silence the voices of others. And uh, I thought it was only fair that I experience one of these directly. Drum grid. Composition for numerous drummers, each positioned on a street corner, beginning with a single drum hit from one player, subsequent drummers imitate the sound of the previous, previous drummer down the block, with the gesture evolving as it travels around the neighborhood. Over time, the performers misinterpret their cues and source material, therefore adding new gestures to the original musical action, as nearby buildings and houses create more false echoes and polyphony. By performing drum grid, a community has agency to change the landscape of their neighborhood, activating potential questions and new generative urgencies.
And thirdly, as I had heard about the existence of the LRADs and other stories about what was happening to Native people in the encampment, I, and all of this emanating from social media, I felt it necessary to go for myself and decipher all of this noise and cascading feedback loop, domino effect of information and misinformation aimed at those who are wanting to learn more. Such mi misinformation was coming not only from opponents of wa the water protectors, but from all directions on the internet allies or non-allies, from people who were there, and more so from people who were not there. When I did arrive, if I, if I can make sense of who was at the Ocheti Shakoan camp, uh, I think I can organize some of these people into three different groups. Uh, the first of these groups being non-native allies, journalists, others who were looking for some kind of burning man camping experience maybe, uh, that was the first group. We could watch that all day, but I'll, we need to leave some time for questions. Uh, report is a musical composition scored for an ensemble playing various caliber, caliber of firearms. The sonic potential of revolvers, handguns, rifles, and shotguns are utilized in a tuned cacophony of percussive blasts interspersed with voids of time silence. In the piece, instruments of violence, justice, defense, and power are transformed into mechanisms for musical resistance. The other type of person I saw at the Standing Rock, Standing Rock camp was, uh, was activists, native activists, non-native activists, but the ones that caught my attention the most were uh, young natives uh, who were uh, wanting to, to show their power in, in a more militant way than your ac average activist, or at least the activist that I had encountered in my life. Um, these were people who I could identify with their anger, but at the same time, uh, they, they seemed very separate from everybody else in the camp. Even uh, you, compared to them, the Burning Man people and everybody else seemed uh, to be related in some way. Um, so it was, for me, they were uh, the loudest of the group, even louder than, than the people who were um, uh, expressing themselves or showing their presence in other ways. And while there, um, I, I take a field recorder with me everywhere. Uh, I began to make field recordings of, of what some of these sounds were uh, and the way that, ways that people were expressing uh, their thoughts and their, their presence and their anger at the pipeline. So I don't know if you're careful, guys. I'm tired. Gotta be quiet. That's the sound of a drone uh, hovering around the camp. The worst thing an American Indian can do is preach to a choir that was never listening. The Native American Composer's Apprentice Project is a project I've been doing for uh, about 14 years uh, where I 
uh, go to the Hopi and Navajo and Salt River Pima reservations and teach young people to write string quartets. Most of these schools on the reservation are very rural and most of them don't have any arts or music uh, curriculum in their, in their schools. If they do, it's to, to have some kind of background music to the sports, uh, to the football game or to the uh, basketball team. Uh, but other than that, there's no emphasis on, uh, on music education. And so the students have one week to write for the string quartet medium, and other than that, there's no rules. There's also no uh, talk of music history, uh, not, not any, surely none of the Western canon, and uh, also not enough time to talk about uh, our own tribal music. What's important for me is just to get their ideas down in the short time that we have in a way that can be relayed to the professional musicians. Here's a piece by uh, a young composer who was 14 years old at the time. Her name is Celeste Lansing from Montezuma Creek, Utah. <laughs> I wasn't planning on Folker to show the uh, score that he did, but it was, <laughs> I'm happy you did. It was uh, influenced by an earlier piece that I had done called Whistle Quartet that you see here. Navajo anthology is utterly connected to language. When something is spoken about, not only has the possibility of its existence now entered into the consciousness and awareness of the speaker and listener, but also a whole new world exists where the things spoken about can now manifest. New worlds are created when sounds are born. So words and phrases and some songs have become a taboo when sounded. The reason I wanted to talk about those and the reason I want to talk about this next piece um, has to do with the third group of people that, uh, that I saw at the camp. And those were people who didn't come to protest or didn't, or at least not in the way we think of protest. Uh, they were uh, native people who came from uh, either nearby, such as uh, South Dakota or Montana or uh, Minnesota, Nebraska, or came from further, so maybe uh, came from Canada or uh, uh, the Southwest where I'm from. And they were people who came simply to be with each other on the land, sharing stories, camping also, but uh, doing nothing more than just being present and reclaiming memory. My Blood is in the Water is a piece that Post Commodity did in 2010, uh, a site-specific installation commissioned for the 400-year anniversary of Santa Fe, New Mexico. My blood is in the water functions as a clock uh, in that it first functions as a sundial. Secondly, every 15 seconds, a drop of blood drips from the mule deer's mouth onto an amplified drum. And thirdly, uh, tells time by telling the story from top to bottom of that spot in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So starting with the sky uh, in a time when there was no life in this area, and then uh, down to the animal, when a time when just animals existed in this spot and no humans. And inside of this deer, this blood forming and, uh, and living, and that representing the native people who, who lived in, 
New Mexico for thousands of years. And that dripping out of the deer's mouth in this long lineage, uninterrupted until it hits the drum, and that being the contact with the Spanish who arrived in the 1500s. And all of that pooling together, mixing, and then dripping back into the ground. Here's the field recordings. So one of the earliest works I had done as a, uh, I, I didn't consider myself a composer back then, just a person who was experimenting with sound, thought it was uh, my responsibility to record uh, not only elders, but record uh, the lands that I was familiar with. And what I wanted to do was make field recordings of the quietest places that I knew of. And so uh, what I would do is, is go to a, a place on a quiet time of day, uh, sometimes very early in the morning or very late at night, and bury a DAT recorder and place a microphone far enough away where I didn't think I would capture even the recording device itself and make a recording of, of these quiet places on quiet days. I would then go back into the studio and turn them up to their maximum. That was the Sandia Mountains uh, outside the mountains for any outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, for anybody who's ever been out there or at least has watched Breaking Bad. <laughs> this is Window Rock, Arizona, which is considered the, the, uh, the, the government uh, capital of the Navajo Nation. And this is Canyon de Chez, Arizona, very close to where I lived, uh, where I grew up and near Chinle, Arizona. The ears between worlds are always speaking as a long form two channel hyperdirectional four act opera projected upon the ancient ruins of Aristotle's Lyceum. Broadcasting for 100 days during last year's Documenta 14 exhibition, which took place in both Castle Germany and Athens, Greece, The Ears Between Worlds was an all day opera consisting of 22 songs. The libretto gathered from the narratives of refugees from Syria and Afghanistan who had arrived in Greece 
stories from migrants who have traversed the desert of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, and stories from the Navajo Long Walk and the Cherokee Trail of Tears, both of these uh, instances uh, being uh, where the U.S. government was trying to remove indigenous people from their homelands and kill them in the process. Two LRADs were mounted on rooftops of the Hellenic Armed Forces Officers Club and the Athens Conservatory of Music, both buildings which surround the Lyceum. Uh, the Lyceum being the site of the School of Peripatetic Learning. At the installation, audiences experience a shifting call and response, hyperdirectionality of sound when walking around the ruins of the school. It was post-commodities feeling that as today we are witnessing the greatest mass migration in the history of mankind, that we are in the potential presence of 60 million scholars seeking refuge. The Journey of the Horizontal People is a string quartet commissioned by Kronos Quartet. The piece is designed so that the players become lost from each other as the music progresses through time. It requires that the quartet include a woman so that she can realign the group when they lose their way. The Journey of the Horizontal People is a future creation story telling of a group of people traveling from west to east across the written page, contrary to the movement of the sun, but involuntarily and unconsciously allegiant to the trappings of time. With their bows, these wanderers sought others like them, knowing that they could survive by finding those other clans who resided in the east, others who shared their linear cosmologies. It is told that throughout the journey, in their own passage of time, this group became the very people they were seeking so, as I spent time at the camp, which was about two weeks, uh, and helping my friend Chinupa take supplies and uh, just visit with his family and, and myself, learning more about that community, uh, which is a place I'd never been, um, there was, uh, I, I, I found myself being one of those people who uh, was there just to exist and not to uh, raise my voice, and if I did, I'd, I don't know what I would uh, say. Um, and even if I had something to say, it would get lost amongst all of the noise that was happening there at the camp. But towards the end of the time I was there, the women uh, of the camp, the elder women, had decided one day, uh, I wish I had a photo of this, but some of you may have seen this on the media, there was a bridge uh, which linked the reservation to uh, the northern part of North Dakota. And the security, DAPL security, had blockaded this uh, bridge so that people couldn't cross. The elder women of the camp had decided one day to just walk uh, onto the bridge and say nothing and stare at the uh, police and security. And uh, so this is a recording of at least a 1,000 women uh, saying nothing.
Post Commodity did one other piece last year uh, for Documenta 14. Some of you may have seen that if you went to Castle. Uh, this was a very subtle piece. Uh, maybe you didn't see it because it was too subtle and, uh, and uh, it was very, uh, there was nothing to see. It was called Blind Curtain. I have a little piece of it here from the deinstall. Blind Curtain is a gift and blessing to the visitors of Documenta 14 from Post Commodity. The installation acts as a threshold for audiences to cleanse themselves, cleanse themselves of the outside world and prepare their hearts, minds, and spirits for the engaging for engaging the transformative experience of Documenta 14. In this regard, Blind Curtain is a physical and conceptual threshold for demarcating outside and inside and acknowledging and reifying the spaces and artworks of Documenta 14, as well as the spaces and contexts between. Simultaneously, Blind Curtain is aware of itself as a node of power it is a determiner of space. It is a border. It is a membrane constructed of pink noise. Blind curtain is a human dilemma that contains secrets, provides access, creates the illusion of privacy, prevents access, provokes surveillance, and embodies love. Thank you. Hey Raven, thank you for your presentation. I just thought I'd start it off. Um, um, I'm trying to put together. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. It's very profound, um, and I'm trying to register some of the what I would call um, ne negation, not meaning negativity in a in a down sense, but actually like like even this pink noise curtain and um, some of those that aspect of your, your practice. And I'm thinking, but I'm, I'm very interested in, I think you said it was a Navajo idea, like one has to be careful what comes into um, sound. We're very, we're in a moment of certainly in visual, visual terms, we have like this absolute explosion all the time of so much imagery that, you know, we have the spam of the earth to use uh, Hitosh Jarrell's term, like it's just so much. And um, I don't, I don't want to make it, a cheap comparison to sound, I am not sh sure. There's obviously lots of sounds, but there's something different going on and something in your work, and this may be this carefulness. Or I just wondered if you want to, if you could say anything else about this. I'm attached to this idea that, that, not, that, that when things come into being through sound, maybe more than image, um, yeah, they, they take on a presence or something, or a, a, mean, a, 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 a reality. Yeah, it was, um, I suppose it, it goes back to that, those field recording pieces where it, it could seem that there was nothing happening, that there was no sound existing. And for me, it, it deciding to, uh, to magnify these, these places with sound. And, and what that meant is, um, in terms of maybe humility, or, uh, or how much you are expected to speak about uh, yourself or, or even more difficult other people uh, or land. And so I think that became an idea through, through a lot of these works is um, 
is is at least the immediate power of making those sounds or or making statements or um, or 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 the obligation of of making music for one um, but then the idea more of of forbidden sounds um, sounds that are still yours but that you are not allowed to to sound or to make happen uh, became another interest of mine. Um, especially the idea of, of maybe uh, taboos, thinking of all these things that you're told not to do and thinking about why you're told not to do them. Um, that's been a, a, a question I've been wondering for my whole life, I think. Um, but it, it became more apparent um, through my own artworks, but also also thinking about uh, just the worldview of, of how uh, sound itself would manifest itself into into the world view and into the reality. Did did you have interaction with the various um, emigres or the refugees that you recorded for the documenta piece? Um, and was there a before and after? In, in their narration of, had they changed through their migration situation? Did any of that come out? Yeah, I, I was there in Athens for about four months, and uh, it was there that I was able to uh, make friends with some refugees who were staying in some of these more kind of squat uh, hotels. And, um, and mostly just visiting, and, and it started off actually was sharing of songs. So myself sharing Navajo songs with some of my new friends and them sharing songs and sharing stories. And um, with them, a lot of them wanted to, they, they really wanted their story to be out there into the world. And, um, and uh, they, uh, they were happy that we were doing a work like this. And, um, and I didn't, I didn't, gather too many, too much content from any one group that I was recording. Um, so the progress might not have ended up in the piece. Um, what Mostly what I kept in the piece was narratives that um, they had specifically wanted to be end up in the, in the opera. And, um, and then some of them, either their own voice ends up in the recording or some of them, uh, the, the narrative was used as a libretto and then maybe the Greek uh, musician saying that. Or, or uh, a woman in New Mexico might have sang uh, that narrative translated into Spanish. And, and so there's a lot of crossing of these stories and given to uh, different musicians on both sides. Uh, so, but the, the other side of that was the, the interviews with migrants in the borderlands. Uh, again, this was a piece that we had done last year, and you had a lot of uh, those people, even then, um, not wanting their, uh, their names or their voices attached to this. They were afraid uh, they might be found to be in the United States. You know, they're very, uh, with good reason, paranoid that they would, their story was getting out there. So it was quite a contrast to the, to the refugees that I was working with in Athens. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where you are with um, processing and how um, you frame or begin to consider um, something that's uh, so um, endlessly difficult, um, the legacy of violence, and then violence um, in its immediacy, the gaps between the space um, where violence continues its ripple effect, and then where and how do you see arrest, or where are you with the tempo within this energetic in your own frame and as you continue to process this? Oh, geez, Ran. Uh, <laughs> heavy. <laughs> um, the best I can do, um, 
is talk about my own people, uh, my own uh, family, those kinds of things. Not only because I'm not, I don't want to get involved in any kind of pan-Indianism, which I think was maybe a, a danger, could, could be the possible danger of something like the Standing Rock Gathering, but more so because I, I don't know if anybody's prepared to process all much more than, uh, than what they have, you know, at least immediately in their history. Um, so for myself, I mean, I, I do that through artwork, uh, for sure, and uh, do that through the education projects, I think, through the Native American Composer Apprenticeship Project. That is one of a few projects that takes me back to my community uh, and has me maybe uh, keeping, keeping the tempo with these younger people, you know, to, to align myself with uh, how they're going through this. And, uh, and then again, there's, there, there's surely a feedback loop in that communication with myself and them. But uh, I, haven't, I haven't thought of it exactly like you asked, but, um, but thank you. Thank you for... I think, I think something extraordinary that you're achieving is um, with uh, both with the gunshots and with the dropping of the blood is um, the silence that uh, the envelope and the atmosphere of silence, which is uh, you're managing to capture scale, which I think is extraordinary that touches uh, some of the mystery that I think often gets lost. So thank you for that. Uh, Raven, the more you travel, do you recognize uh, globalization of the sound? Uh, <laughs> globalization of sound. Uh, sound always has, well, music always has this uh, relationship with the market. I think that's that's difficult to to navigate and to comprehend. And it's, um, it's always kind of sometimes making the market irrelevant also. Um, but in the globalization, I think there's then thinking about maybe the tools that are used to create music. Uh, I'm skeptical of those sometimes. Um, I, I work with electronics and uh, computers, you know, as we all do, but I, I'm, I, I'm skeptical of, of things like software sometimes and, and the way that those can normalize art. And uh, I, I think that's the best way I can answer that. I don't, I don't try to, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that I've traveled enough to, to enough rural places. They don't, they don't have the opportunity to invite artists a lot of times. So um, I think I wouldn't, I, it's not fair of me to answer that for those communities right now. Um, but, but yeah, it's something I think about. And it's something I think about when uh, you have um, maybe indigenous people or people in rural communities having access to new tools, what they do with those tools. Um, that can be exciting, but at the same time, I think it's, it's good to have skepticism around who's steering us into making a particular kind of art. Raven, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of non-human creatures in your art. So we had the caged birds at the very beginning, and then the dead deer, and I don't know if you have other pieces that invoke the, the animal the, the ornithological world, or if it's just those two pieces? We have another piece, post-commodity, called Gallup Motel Butchering, where we, uh, a woman butchers a sheep in a motel room, in a Motel 6 bathroom. Um, all three of those pieces, the animals are treated as spiritual mediators to the land, um, and, and in some way representing the people who are of those lands. Uh, that's the reason for their, their use. Um, the, with the exception of the finches, because they're somebody's pet. Uh, the other animals were, were eaten and butchered in a way that uh, would be appropriate to, to the place. So in uh, Gallup Motel, but the Gallup Motel butchering piece, there was a huge feast around that, and also with the deer as well. The deer was served at the art opening.
Yes, I, I found it interesting that um, you spoke about um, coming and working with children on a reservation and uh, making the choice to teach some musical tools for string quartet and uh, without referencing history and uh, obviously colonial European history. And uh, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about tradition and, and somehow this, yeah, the tradition of Western classical music, um, you know, our recent tradition of electronics and, and then your native traditions. Um, yeah, if there, uh, really the, the, the truth is with that project, there's, there's not enough time. If there was time, I'd try to show them every kind of music that I know of, you know. Um, I don't, that still doesn't mean I'd start with the Western Canyon, not a canon, but, uh, but still it would, uh, it all starts with a huge respect for the instruments involved, um, and how they work and, and, uh, Letting the students know you there's not you can't improve the violin you know it's not going to get any better than how it is now, um, and then just having them have a respect for those uh, those tools, and um, I the the when we get to a place where we're talking about traditional tribal music, that's something that I wait to see if it get if they bring it up or if they have examples. And usually what that is, is they'll find examples um, in their own tribe's music to, to understand better the, the notation maybe, or the, the concepts of composition. So one example is maybe a vibrato, you know, they, they might have an understanding of vibrato, but relate it to singing. So, it's, you know, ah, you know, then it's like a very wide vibrato they would draw in. Uh, things like that would end up you know, becoming the conversation, but uh, more as, as the student brings it up and it's usually in relation to something that uh, is a musical concept that we're working on. So the authorities are telling me we have one more question before we move on to more okay. Um Interesting, pre interesting presentation. I was wondering, uh, oftentimes I know that the fellows here at the academy are in Berlin for some particular project or some particular take on their art. And I was just wondering if you had anything at this early juncture that you would like to say about what you might be finding here in Berlin. There's nothing site specific uh, that I'll be working on for Berlin, but uh, I said this, uh, uh, a week ago or so when we gave our introductions here. Um, of course, this is a city with one of the greatest music communities on the planet. So uh, surely uh, I have access to all of this live music that I, w I wouldn't have anywhere else. And just to be able to be in a place and take advantage of that is is going to be my work. Thank you, Raven. Thank you, Volker. And please do join us. Thank you.